And I call on Kate Forbes to speak to and to move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have time in the Chamber today to debate how Scotland can become a digital society for all and how we all are already well on our way to doing that. I thank members who have signed the motion to make that possible and I look forward to hearing contrib contributions from across the Chamber. So a digital society for all, what does that mean? Well, the way that we can best understand what it means is by talking to older eh, and disabled um, users whose lives have been transformed by having access to digital platforms. Take David, for example. David led a fairly isolated life. He has epilepsy and suffers from chronic mental illness, which made it difficult for him to socialise. He recently took part in a scheme called Clever Cogs, run by Blackwood Homes and Care, which is designed to increase digital participation for adults who are in receipt of care and support packages. And the scheme uses technology and design to develop low cost ways of providing services that improve the quality of life, improve choice and give greater independence. Since taking part in the scheme, David has learned a whole new set of digital skills that have given him the confidence to challenge himself and live life to the, to the full. He used the bespoke systems to educate himself on a range of topics, including ways of managing his depression and anxiety. But you don't want to hear what I think of it. In David's own words, he says, Clever Cogs has wakened me right up. It's made me come out of myself, so I'm not just sitting at home anymore. And almost every day, I'm going out now and doing things for my neighbours if they are struggling because of old age. I didn't do that before. I just kept myself to myself. Now, David's story demonstrates how technology has been life-changing, not only for him, but for his ageing neighbours too. And I had the privilege of meeting one of his neighbours earlier today, Mandy, another clever COGS user. Now, she's in the gallery, and I promised her beforehand that I'd give her a wave from the chamber so that she could wave back. So this is her wave. And Mandy uses a, a tablet. She did. did she wave? She did. Good. Um, Mandy uses a, a tablet. She has been the recipient of the Service User Achievement Award for pioneering the system by tutoring her neighbours in the technology that Clever Cogs uses, building a better sense of community and improving well-being. And I asked her what she uses her tablet for. She told me that she is the um, champion online bowler in her care home that she listens regularly to Elvis on repeat on YouTube, um, and she also FaceTimes her sister. Furthermore, in terms of improving independence, because her tablet is linked to her caseworkers' phones, she can contact them in that way as well. And it gives her that control that she needs. The system is personalised to her, it's intuitive, and she can even pick what she's going to eat for lunch because the kitchen staff add the menu online. So Clever Cogs um, and other systems like it are building up digital skills amongst the older and the disabled um, population. It is giving them directly more independence, more control over their lives. And we are seeing more and more people get online. David and Mandy have clearly made great changes in their own lives and the lives of others. And their experiences are documented in the report that was published today by the Carnegie UK Trust called Living Digitally, an evaluation of the Clever, Clever Cogs digital care and support system. And the results of that independent research back up the anecdotes and the stories that I've heard from Mandy and David and many others. It clearly demonstrates the impact that digital participation can have. Participants in the study reported increased life satisfaction and most significantly the life satisfaction of people aged 55 to 64 rose considerably. There were also improvements in the number of people accessing useful health information with several indicators of improved levels of independence in customers' daily living. And this is a critical point for me as somebody who believes strongly that Scotland can be at the forefront of the digital revolution, that we are seeing the enormous potential 
for our economy and for our society in ensuring that our people have digital skills, that our businesses and third sector and public sector organisations are using digital better, and that Scotland has the workforce and the expertise and the talent and the technology to be able to share with the rest of the world. But at the end of the day, it comes back to the individuals whose lives are transformed. We want to create a digital society, not just for those that can already access it, but we want to find new ways to tackle all the issues that affect digital participation. And incidentally, that does have to include connectivity. It has to include accessibility and it has to include affordability. And our commitment to provide access to super fast broadband for each and every home and business in Scotland is the most ambitious of any target across the UK because we see the significance of two things. Firstly, to ensure that the infrastructure does not exclude anybody. And that secondly, once that infrastructure is in place, we are equally ambitious in supporting people to be able to use it. £600 million is being invested in the initial procurement of the Reaching 100% programme, the single largest investment made by any government in the UK in digital connectivity. And I'll take the intervention. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank Ms Forbes for taking my intervention? Uh, this, my point is less about the delivery of the infrastructure, but more about the skills required to use that infrastructure. If, if it's true that one in five uh, people in Scotland uh, do not uh, have basic digital skills, a figure quoted by SCVO. Uh, how is the government going to address that? Minister. Thank you for that intervention. And it's a vitally uh, important point because I see the importance of digital skills as not just being something that we deliver to a particular section of, the so of society. So it's by the time we for example, are um, giving our young people digital skills at university or colleges, it's too late. It has got to start, first of all, in schools. And in partnership with the current Digital Champions Network, we are offering coding clubs to disadvantaged young people through schools and through library networks and continue to support the extension of extracurricular coding activities as part of the Digital Extra programme. The member will also be aware that to date we have funded Code Clan with over three million pounds to provide Scotland's first industry-led digital skills academy. And that offers students an intensive four-month training programme with direct access to employers and an opportunity to attain a professional development qualification. So the opportunities are already there. They exist through community hubs, whether that's for silver surfers to get online, to learn new talents, to reduce social isolation, and to take advantage of all the internet has to offer. But we are, already, we are also ensuring that young people are picking up the digital skills as they go through schools. Um, and I could give one example where those two things work in tandem. So Antonine Primary School in Falkirk, where 55 school children have teamed up with 20 silver surfers to share learning around um, particular aspects of history. So in particular, they're looking at World War I and a true digital society has got to recognize the ways in which we can share expertise across the generations. And it's also one where everybody's uh, opinion matters in that respect. The digital sector contributes to employment and economic growth across Scotland. 5.2 billion GVA to the Scottish economy in 2016. And it's forecast to be the fastest growing sector in Scotland from now until 2024. But to get the benefits of that revolution, we have got to adopt a cradle to the grave approach. It's essential that we involve everyone at the most formative stage in their lives to ensure we provide the essential tools at the earliest possible stage that will best equip their life journey. One of the um, interesting initiatives has been a partnership with the Book Trust, who currently operate the Book Bug programme to provide free Book Bug bags to every child in Scotland. And we're developing an, a smartphone app which will complement the existing scheme. Which takes me on to a, another aspect of digital participation. And that is that 
we have got to consider people's rights as well. We are increasingly recognising that it's nonsensical to refer to a digital world as though it's independent of the world. The digital world is the current world as we see it. And I uh, opened the summit, um, which was organised by Young Scott and the youth leaders, promoting the Five Rights Agenda in Scotland last month. And the ultimate aim of that Five Rights programme is to put power in the hands of young people so that they know how to be resilient and to respond positively to all that the digital world has to offer. And it's the Scottish Government's intention to use that Five Rights work as the foundation of a future-proof and inclusive ethical framework which underpins how technology is built, provides the safeguards that we increasingly need and ensures that young people and all generations have the rights that they need uh, in this digital world. Those rights will not only provide, be available to, to young people, obviously, it's right throughout. So these opportunities are for everyone to become confident, creative and fearless innovators and unlock the full potential of people and new technologies. From cyber tots through cyber teams to silver surfers, the Scottish Government is trying to spread an understanding amongst its citizens that in a society where bad news travels faster than the speed of light, the internet can be used as a tool for good. And that is seen so clearly when it comes to Mandy and David's experiences through Clever Cogs. We can learn a lot as a society about embracing change and supporting people to realise their potential, wherever they live, whatever their age, and whatever challenges they face. Digital should be a way of enabling us to live lives to the full, and we need to ensure that all of Scotland reaps the social, economic, and cultural benefits that digital technology offers. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Donald Cameron to open for the Conservatives and to speak to and move amendment in his name. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to formally move the amendment uh, in my name. And can I take this opportunity somewhat belatedly to welcome Kate Forbes to um, the front bench. Um, representing my home constituency, she'll be well aware of the problems of digital connectivity in our part of the world. Uh, and I'm delighted that, that she's representing uh, the government in this particular brief. Um, it's vital, Presiding Officer, that we ensure that Scotland is not only one of the most technologically advanced nations in the world, but also that our citizens are the most technologically capable too. By doing so, we can further grow our economy, create new jobs and remain competitive as a nation. We all know of the need to improve productivity in Scotland and without doubt digital in inclusion is one of the many aspects of the solution to that particular and pressing problem. Digital inclusion is also a practical necessity for people in their everyday lives as new technologies can of course improve quality of life and improve personal health to mention a few of the many advantages that accrue from this. However, age barriers, a lack of early intervention through education, the impact of disabilities and geographical location are just some of the barriers that exist. And frequently when it's an issue of access, and let's be brutally honest here, this is often because such access is unaffordable. As the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations note, the evidence clearly shows digital exclusion exacerbates existing deep-rooted inequalities, and affordability is a key barrier to those in the poorest communities. SEVO also state that 21% of people in Scotland do not have basic digital skills. Given the ever-increasing significance of digital inclusion, the fact that people are prevented from being included due to the sheer cost should shame us all. And in a report published earlier this year, CAB Scotland found that just over a third of respondents stated that they either had difficulty or could not use a computer. And in my own Highlands and Islands region, we still have issues with reliable broadband and mobile internet access, a lack of which poses huge problems for local businesses and residents. And I'll come back to that later on. The Scottish Conservatives welcome efforts to improve the inclusivity of technology and increasing access to it. And we welcome its inclusion in the government's own digital strategy for Scotland. But we will hold the SNP government to account on these commitments to ensure that they come to fruition. Now, I readily acknowledge that this is an issue which requires cross-party cooperation. But it is incumbent upon me, I think, to set out some of our concerns 
that existing support schemes, which could be used to improve digital inclusivity, have not had the, co the, co the impact that may be desired. For example, we note that it took more than a year for the government to invest any money from its digital growth fund that was announced last year. Similarly, the Scottish Growth Scheme, which is designed to support business, had only paid out 25 million in two years, a far cry from the 500 million pledged to the scheme when it was launched. Now, while both of these funds will undoubtedly cover a variety of areas, it is concerning that so little progress has been achieved with both, and I ask the SNP government to reflect on this going forward. However, we do welcome the recognition by the government today of the Living Digitally report by Carnegie UK and Just Economics, which focuses on a system designed to help people with disabilities access the internet with confidence. And it's just one example of collaboration between the public, private, and voluntary sectors. And I acknowledge in particular the, report, the remarks in the report about the clever cog system, which has been mentioned by the minister, which showed increased happiness and reduced feelings of depression amongst its users. It's important that we also ensure that every young person is able to access and benefit from digital technology. And I found it particularly striking that according to CAB Scotland, those in the least deprived areas are twice as likely to be able to use a com computer well than those in the most deprived areas. It's therefore imperative there is early intervention for young people in order to help alter these trends. However, in order to achieve these aims and reduce digital inequality, we need to ensure there is adequate infrastructure to facilitate it in the first place. And whilst I think this is perhaps too interesting and nuanced a debate to lapse into the usual arguments about who is responsible for broadband in Scotland, it is, I think, important to put on record that we continue to support the aims of the R100 programme. As a Highlands and Islands MSP, I know all too well the importance of ensuring that every home, no matter how rural or remote, can access fast and reliable broadband. According to Audit Scotland, average broadband speeds continue to be the lowest in rural areas. And out of the 376,000 households still unable to access super-fast broadband, less than half will be able to do so by the R100 deadline of 2021. I mention these simply as a reminder that we still have a long way to go to deliver the vital infrastructure necessary to afford all our citizens the opportunity to benefit from digital technology. And that is why we have noted that in our amendment. Yes. Stuart Stevenson. Um, the member appears to have uh, cast doubt on the delivery of the R100 to 100% of uh, premises in Scotland in 2021, what basis does he uh, claim that only 50% of the remainder will get that? Donald Cameron. Thank you. Well, quite simply, the Audit Scotland report, which I, I mentioned. Um, but moving on to some local examples, it's easy to talk about digital inclusivity from Edinburgh, where we all work in a high technology environment here in the Scottish Parliament. But to understand the benefits of inclusivity, it's helpful to share some first-hand experiences from the areas we represent. And I'd just like to mention the e School project in Stornoway, which I visited last month, where schools across the Western Isles, the Highlands and beyond have linked up using state-of-the-art video technology to deliver classes and, as a result, offer greater subject choice to young people in some of the remote, most remote parts of Scotland. And one example of this is that of a local music teacher, but previously she had to travel between three schools on Lewis, racking up miles in her car and spending little time with her pupils. Now, thanks to technology, she can base herself in one school for a whole week and be with the children there and deliver classes to the other two schools of our video link. The following week, she can do the same from another one of her schools. For her, it meant cutting her travel time by a third. For the council, it meant saving money. For the pupils, it means face-to-face -face contact with their teacher. Oh, there was the math teacher who I witnessed teaching remotely, and astonishingly, his students mid-lesson were able to message him confidentially if they were struggling with a topic going way beyond traditional learning methods. The barrier to education was now being resolved through technology and it was truly inspirational. But on the flip side, we've also all seen the mass banking closures across many rural and remote parts of Scotland. Rural parts of Scotland are far more liable to have slower broadband speeds than urban Scotland. And that's why the decision by banks and in fact any major business when they decide to significantly alter or reduce their presence in our rural areas can have such a devastating impact. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, a digitally inclusive society is as much about social progress as it is about economic benefit. Because if we can ensure that everyone, irrespective of background, not only has access to new and existing technologies, but are able to cope with the ever-changing digital world that we live in, 
then we can be sure that Scotland can be a digital powerhouse. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call uh, Colin Smith to speak to move the amendment in his name. Thank you, President Officer. And can I welcome Kate Forbes to her new ministerial role and wish her well. Today, almost every aspect of society has been transformed by technological advancements. How businesses operate, our approach to shopping, the services we access, the way we are educated, or how we function in the workplace is all constantly changing as we become an increasingly digital society. It's therefore little wonder that research by which found that nine out of 10 people view a broadband connection as a necessity alongside water and energy utilities and food and housing. That's a higher proportion than those who identify the television, a phone, a car or savings as a necessity. These advancements open up a vast range of new opportunities for individuals, businesses and communities and can bring significant social and economic advantages as Kate Forbes highlighted in David and Mandy's experience with the Clever Clogs digital care and support system. I'll say more about that in my closing speech at the end of the debate, but in moving Labour's amendment, I want to highlight the fact that these benefits are, are sadly not often being felt equally. It would be too easy to presume that everyone has the basic skills to navigate their way around this digital world or even has access to that technology if they had the skills. But too many people in Scotland are digitally excluded. There are many reasons for this. Scotland's beautiful but fragmented landscape provides challenges in making the necessary technology available for all. And shortcomings in the government's connectivity policy have failed so far to overcome those barriers. The much touted digital superfast Scotland broadband programme helped facilitate the rollout of digital broadband, but it also entrenched some of Scotland's digital divide. Even now, I yeah, oh, certainly will, yeah. Kate Forbes. Thank, I thank the member for that and, and recognising the comments I made earlier about infrastructure. What is his view on how we ensure, though, that where there is adequate infrastructure, we are ensuring that those that can use digital are supported to actually use it? Because there is a disconnect between the 5% that don't have the infrastructure and the much bigger number of people who are not actually using what we have. I Colin thank, Smith. Thank you for, for that intervention. I, I think she raises a very important point, which I'm going to come to in, a, a, in a detail in my speech because of a, a large number of groups, whether it's based on income, disability, age or other factors, are currently excluded from accessing those services. And I'll touch on that in some of my ideas uh, later on in my, in my speech. But at the moment, one of those uh, groups that are, of course, digitally excluded are people living in rural areas. Well, digital broadband coverage is at more than 97% nationally. In some of our rural areas, for example, Orkney, it's down to 82% with access to super fast broadband at just 65%. Now that's far from unique. In the Western Isles and in Ross Sky and Lacaber, almost 30% of people don't have access to super fast speeds. And across the board, rural areas have much poorer access to digital and super fast broadband. And the wider challenges these communities face, challenges relating to the economy, access and services are exasperated by this digital divide. But it's not just connectivity issues that are holding Scotland back. The 2017 Scottish Household Survey found a clear correlation between income and internet access, stating that home internet access tends to increase with household income. Indeed, 99% of households with an annual income of more than £40,000 have home internet access compared to 56% of those earning between £6,001 and £10,000. And that's a difference of 40 3%. Too often, the most disadvantaged in society are being excluded from the opportunities, services and information provided by home internet access. The Scottish Household Survey also revealed a persistent age gap in internet use, with only 63% of adults aged 60 and above and 37% of those aged 75 and above using the internet, compared to 99% of those aged 16 to 24. Now, while progress has been made in this area, there remains a great deal more to do. Another worrying trend identified in the Scottish Household Survey was the fact that those with some form of physical or mental health condition were 20% less likely to use the internet than those without such a condition. I think that reveals a serious failure to remove barriers faced by those with disabilities. But again, it highlights how digital exclusion reinforces existing inequalities. And that's also the case when the household survey identified a gender gap in digital skills, albeit the information we have on this is still limited. If we are to tackle digital exclusion, we need therefore more comprehensive data on who is being excluded and why. 
But what is already clear is that digital exclusion is inseparable from broader social and economic inequalities, and advancing digital inclusion is therefore essential to improving inclusion more broadly. In terms of coverage, as Donald Cameron highlighted, the R100 programme does aim to address the significant shortcomings of the previous broadband rollout programme, such as the failure to set a minimum speed, and it aims to tackle some of the issues facing rural communities in terms of access. Now, Labour fully supports the aims of the programme and its 100% a super fast broadband coverage target by the end of 2021 or indeed sooner. However, I am concerned by Audit Scotland's assessment that meeting this target remains to be difficult. The commitment needs to be delivered in full, but I have yet to be convinced that the Scottish Government have the resources and clear plan in place in order to achieve this. Now, I welcome the plan, but I also welcome the Scottish Government's investment to enable improvements in 4G coverage. And I look forward to seeing the details of their 5G strategy. However, again, well, what is, is, is welcome and much needed, it is still far from transformative. And as I said earlier, expanding coverage is only the first step in improving access. Ensuring genuine digital inclusion means taking a holistic view of access and looking at what additional barriers people may face. There's a real risk that individuals and communities who have been digitally excluded to date will continue to miss out on the opportunities the growth in digital will bring. For that reason, presiding officer, in conclusion, it's clear that Scotland does face a digital divide. Rural communities, those on the lowest incomes, people with physical or mental health conditions, older people who suffer because of digital exclusion are frankly being excluded. And that exclusion mirrors wider social and economic uh, inequalities, but it also exasperates could you those come inequalities. To close, a comprehensive strategy, presiding officer, is therefore needed. And that's why I'm happy to move Labour's amendment calling for this. Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, like others, can I welcome uh, Kate Bobbs to our, our position. I think this is the first time I've been in a, a debate with her in this, in this role in the Chamber as well, so uh, I'm sure we'll all wish her well in that position. I can also uh, draw members' attention to the fact that I'm a member of the Open Rights Group. Uh, I do welcome the, the chance to take part in, in this debate, and I'd like to recognise that there are some positive points being made on all sides. However, I also believe that there are some aspects of this agenda being missed by all sides. The, uh, the government motion, for example, with, with which I've, I've got no great beef and I'll, I'll, I'll happily support it, does say that increasing digital participation will in turn provide better access to fair work and higher wage jobs. For some people, yes, it will. But digital participation alone is no guarantee of that. We're all very aware uh, of those involved in the gig economy, uh, people who are highly connected, highly adept at using uh, online platforms, uh, and yet they are uh, being exploited in, in, in poorly paid and insecure work. Digital participation, like many other innovations in life, can be used for good or for ill. And the economy that we build around it can be a fair and sustainable one, or it can be an exploitative and wasteful one. The Conservative uh, amendment talks about the, the impact uh, of uh, the, the digital economy on, if, if I can put it this way, the real world economy, the high street, and their digital services tax, which was introduced or announced uh, in the budget yesterday, is an interesting innovation. It's likely to be too modest in scale to really reverse the impact they're talking about, but they are certainly acknowledging a genuine issue and we should all welcome the fact that that's a, a conversation that's taking place. However, the, the continual spats between governments about exactly who's to blame for broadband rollout not being as, as fast as some people would like, uh, this kind of uh, dynamic solves nothing. Uh, you know, if we, if we want the state to act in this regard, presiding officer, then let's argue for public ownership of infrastructure. And I, I don't hear that case coming actually from either government uh, in, in this case. And we should also consider what the long-term goal is in terms of broadband. Just how fast is fast enough? This isn't simply a, a question of building infrastructure anew uh, every decade or so when technology uh, moves on a pace and the demand for data goes up. The energy considerations alone of getting faster and faster and faster uh, are, are being ignored. But the vast majority of domestic applications is a 10 meg connection really digital exclusion? I question that. I've, 
I, I've stood in my living room flying around the virtual reality version of Google Earth, a fully 3D rendered planet streaming through a broadband connection perfectly happily uh, without the kind of uh, extremely high speeds that we're talking about as though this is a, an absolute requirement for everybody. So there is a, a point at which we, we say fast enough uh, can be reached. Uh, Labour also cite many issues in their amendment which we should all share a great deal of concern about, not least the impact of inequality of digital participation. But it is easy to say, as the, their amendment says, that the government is failing. Uh, and like, I'm afraid, a great many Labour amendments in the chamber, uh, the, 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 the amendment says the government is failing, but doesn't include much in the way of positive proposals. I would like to argue a little deeper, though, uh, and question the nature, not just the extent, of digital participation. Is digital participation about creating an online space in which we merely consume services and products, or is it a space for collaboration, for creativity, for community? It's the nature of that participation that we should be concerned about. Is the role of, of education about empowering young people to be uh, merely passive consumers or to take hold of powerful new tools to make their society better. And what can digital participation mean without digital rights? Government publications from both governments, I feel, have been too silent on the question of digital rights. Uh, and that's uh, a failing, uh, particularly in response to the scandals that we've seen in relation uh, to companies like Facebook and Cambridge Analytica in recent years. A free and open internet uh, is not just a, a commercialized space. It can't allow, be allowed to simply be a commercialized space in which more and more control over our lives is taken silently and invisibly by service providers, content providers, advertisers, even by the social media platforms that we all enjoy using. Well, sometimes we can still manage to enjoy them, uh, but uh, you know, many of us choose to, to, to use those platforms without necessarily being conscious of the degree of control that's taken by them. Uh, as the uh, Open Rights Group uh, talked about in their recent paper on the impact of Brexit on digital rights, uh, international trade agreements do have a long history of disregarding democracy and reflecting corporate agendas. And tech giants at the moment around the world are becoming very dominant in negotiations with the US in relation to cross-border trade, e-commerce, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, amongst the arguments they made were the point that digital privacy must not be allowed uh, to undermine, uh, must not be allowed to be undermined in the name of protecting free flow of data. And censorship should not be promoted through draconian or voluntary uh, online IP enforcement commitments. I'd like these issues to be addressed as well as the, the role of, of surveillance in our society, whether by state or corporate players, uh, privacy and consent. These issues raise more questions than answers, and I don't pretend otherwise. But discussing digital participation only in terms of uptake fails to give us the fuller picture we need. We should be at least as interested in the nature of participation and the changing social, economic, and even political relationships in our society that will emerge. Call Mike Rumbles for up to six minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, on behalf of the Liberal Democrats, I also welcome Kate Forbes to her new role. We wish her well because she knows, as we all do, that delivering the Scottish Government's ambitious commitment of 100% coverage of superfast broadband by 2021 will be challenging. And that the task before the Minister has been made all the more difficult because of the glacial progress of previous ministers and cabinet secretaries towards this goal. Fast and reliable access to the internet and a dependable mobile phone signal is no longer a luxury. Good connectivity, as we all agree, is now an essential service that allows our communities, individuals, and businesses to thrive. However, the benefits of good connectivity go far, far beyond the economic benefits Access to online knowledge, education and public services supports the spread of ideas, broadens horizons, should improve civic engagement and enables research to take place almost instantaneously across borders and at a global level. Unfortunately, it is those that could benefit the most that have often been left behind and society has quickly divided into those that can easily access our digital economy and those who are excluded. 
Now, the Scottish Government would do a great service to those communities and, in, and individuals who have been excluded if it provided a meaningful programme of digital education and universal access to superfast broadband as soon as possible. Now, the Minister will be aware that I lodged an amendment to this motion, unfortunately it wasn't chosen for debate, where I was trying to be helpful to the Scottish Government. Trying to be helpful to the Scottish Government, Mr Lyle. Their target for 100% coverage is to do this by December 2021. Now, wouldn't it be immensely helpful to the Scottish Government for their target to be brought forward to the 1st of May of that year? After all, this was the date that was in the SNP manifesto for the 2016 election. I have read the manifesto. I'm not sure Richard Lyle has. I'm sure that if the Scottish Government has the will to implement its own manifesto, it could do this. Obviously, I'm only trying to be helpful to the Minister with this suggestion. It's not the first time in this chamber that I've urged the Scottish Government to get a move on with their R100 programme. I've brought to the attention of Scottish Government Ministers the fact that thousands of homes in areas such as Aberdeenshire are experiencing nothing like the levels of connectivity promised. In some cases, internet speeds reach barely one megabit per second, while mobile phone coverage is intermittent and even non-existent. Only last week, a constituent whose home is in Inverurie, a town of 10,000 and more residents, reported that he could not find a provider or a contract that would deliver speeds of more than six megabits per second. Now, it's unfortunate that when the SNP promised in 2012 to deliver 95% fibre coverage, and that next generation broadband will be available to all by 2020, that they did not start by investing in the areas that would see the most benefit. I know Kate Forbes would be aware of that. I have lost count of the number of times I've been told that despite living only a stone's throw from a green cabinet, residents can scarcely access the most basic internet services. Of course. Kate Forbes, I thank the member for taking that intervention. And like the member, I believe that connectivity, universal connectivity is vitally important. However, my question to him, made in a constructive spirit, is that even with connectivity, we see that not all adults, for example, know how to access the internet. To give him one stat, that about one third of those between the ages of 45 and 74 do not access the internet at home, not because they don't have connectivity, but because there's a, 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 an issue with skills. How does he propose to actually respond to that? Mike Rumble. The manager makes a good point in the same spirit. I have to say that there's no point in educating people and helping people if they can't access the service first. Accessibility is really important. Not everybody will take it up, but accessibility is important and, and, and we've got to tackle both of these issues. And the truth of the matter is that the Scottish Government has relied on local authorities, business gateways such as HIE, commercial operators and the UK Government to do a great deal of the heavy lifting. And as a matter of fact, the Scottish Government's own contribution to the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme has around to, amounted to about 15% of the total investment so far. And I, I know there is no need to remind me, even before Richard Lyle gets on his feet, before he gets onto his feet, not on this point, Richard, I'd rather make the point first. I'm running out of Mr. time. Mr Lyle, please I'm, sit down. I, I'm running out of time. If I had more time, I would be delighted Mr. to Mr Lyle. The member has said he does not wish an intervention. Please respect that. If Mr. I had Rumbles. more time, I certainly would do, Richard. There's, as I say, there's no need to remind me that it's a reserve matter and the responsibility of the UK government. But just like there's no need to remind my colleagues on the SNP benches that it's now six years since they promised to deliver super fast broadband to everyone, uh, that only three years of that commitment remains and it's yet to be uh, going to be achieved. Presiding, Deputy Presiding Officer, I fully support the motion put forward by the Minister today. Uh, I also support both amendments. And I hope that everyone in this chamber will agree that good and reliable access to a digital economy is not a luxury but a necessity. So in trying to be really helpful to the government, I ask the Minister to return to the commitment they made in the manifesto, deliver the R100 programme by May 2021 rather than the end of that year. Because after all, wouldn't the Scottish Government be proud to achieve the 100% coverage for all by the next election because it would be in their interests to do so? Thank you. We now move to the open debate and speeches of up to six minutes, please. Uh, we are a bit pushed for time. No extra time can be allowed. Emma Harper followed by Jamie Green. 
Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this debate today as a representative of the South Scotland region, which is a rural area which has faced challenges with digital competence, connectivity and uptake. We're all in agreement that tackling the barriers to digital inclusion and ensuring digital connectivity across the whole of Scotland will be key to realising the advantages of the digital world, which has been highlighted already. And it'll, in turn, it will boost productivity and efficiency. I'd like to focus my speech this afternoon specifically on the last part of the Scottish Government motion, which indicates that improving digital participation and inclusion will also benefit the delivery of health care in Scotland. And as a nurse and uh, deputy convener of the health committee, I need to alert chamber to that. The motion states, recognises that a combined focus by government, the wider public sector and private and voluntary sectors is the most effective way of increasing digital participation, which in turn will support effective person-centred public services, such as the health and social care sector, to develop innovative solutions and enable Scotland to be a digital society for all. So, presiding officer, members might be aware of one programme which is aiming to do exactly this the Attend Anywhere programme. Attend Anywhere, administered by the Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare, along with NHS boards and NHS 24, is a resource which allows patients access to healthcare specialists and healthcare professionals, GPs, psychologists, nurses and physios, as well as others, in the comfort of their own home, their work or a place of ease and comfort to them. It has many benefits for people's daily lives. It means that patients can see their GP without even leaving their home to go to the GP surgery. It means that people can access their psychologist or healthcare professional without going to a clinic or hospital. And it also encourages people to seek medical advice where they may not have done so previously due to a better ease of access. In addition, Attend Anywhere also has benefits to health. It means that those that have severe and complex health care needs, they may not need to travel to see their professionals, which may in some cases where patients experience, for example, chronic pain, or indeed where patients have mental health conditions, it might reduce the stress of having to leave the house. Between 2017 and 18, the Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare enabled 7,500 new patients to have access to and benefit from home and mobile health monitoring. It supported the Scale Up BP programme to deliver the large, largest scale of uh, blood pressure monitoring to date. It delivered 1,200 consultations to patients with over 67 GP practices and registered the use of the service. And most importantly, it supported 4,000 people across Scotland to learn about the programme and transfer their knowledge of it to others on their respective areas. While I understand that some patients may be fearful or reluctant to take up this programme, I absolutely understand the need for patients to have a choice about the programme after they have been informed about the positives and the negatives of it. Presiding officer, last year the Scottish Government published its digital strategy which set out how it intends to place digital at the heart of everything it does, from reforming public services to delivering economic growth. This is welcome. However, in order to achieve this aim of placing digital at the heart of everything, the Scottish Government must ensure and encourage a combined effort from itself, third sector organisations and voluntary organisations in order to help communities, enable them and people and businesses to have the confidence, the resources and infrastructure in place to become digitally enabled. Such a third sector organisation currently operates in Castle Douglas, in my South Scotland region, the IT centre. The IT centre, managed by Jackie Williams, provides access to computers, laptops and tablets to people who are requiring digital services for their daily lives. People in the local area rely on the IT centre for assistance with applications for jobs, welfare support and also for access to college and university applications. The IT Centre also offers courses in CV writing as well as introductory courses on the use of IT, basic programming and other, other programming like that. I'd like to see such projects rolled out across and supported across Scotland as we move towards a digital society. And I would welcome the Minister to visit when her diary permits. Presiding Officer, in conclusion, 
If we are to have a fully digital Scotland, we must first ensure that we have the necessary resources in place to give people the confidence to use the technology. And I would therefore like to encourage the Scottish Government to continue to make Scotland the best digital society it can be, whilst allowing people the time, education and resources to come the resources to come to terms with the changes, such as those changes which come with programmes such as Attend Anywhere. Finally, presiding officer, the IT centre and places like such in Castle Douglas offer benefits to many people that also have additional learning needs as well. And so they are providing an excellent opportunity for people to become digitally competent. Thank you. Jamie Green, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I welcome Kate Forbes to her role uh, and this renewed focus on the digital economy, connectivity and digital inclusion is very welcome from these benches. After joining uh, this parliament, uh, I was my party spokesman for the digital economy and connectivity uh, and I, as some of you will recall, uh, and that stems from a career in uh, media technology. I spent much of that time uh, asking government to focus on a centralised approach on how Scotland can be a truly inclusive nation. I also felt that a dedicated minister focusing on digital uh, was much needed, so the reshuffle was news to uh, uh, our ears in that respect. The Carnegie report on the Clever Cogs work, I think, was an interesting read. Uh, the, a perfect example of how technology uh, can be used uh, in the social sector to great effect. Um, it is true that digital change has come around very quickly uh, over the last few years, and I think adapting to that change has been difficult for some. It is important that we take advantage of uh, a digital society, but by doing so, make sure that no one is left behind. Uh, the minister uh, opened this debate by talking about uh, three ways of achieving that, connectivity, accessibility, and affordability. I think that's a very sensible uh, and fair analysis of what we need to do. Uh, if I could perhaps put things slightly differently, and I think the three things that people need are as follows. The first is hardware. And by hardware, I mean infrastructure. And that's physical access to devices, be it a smartphone, a tablet, a computer, and obviously connectivity via broadband or other means. And that access doesn't need to be in the home. It can be in public spaces, such as libraries, schools, and community centers, as it is often delivered throughout Scotland. But it also requires the third uh, the second point and that's the right skills to use that and much has been said about that today and whether that starts at school or even preschool uh, through college university uh, and pro professional development it also needs to involve those who have access to none of the above uh, so through uh, community schemes uh, charitable organizations the third sector and even uh, dare i say government uh, operated schemes uh, we need to ensure that no one truly is left behind so the more we can be illustrated in today's debate uh, the better in that respect. I'd be happy to give way in that point. Kate Forbes. I wonder what the member thinks is the role of digital companies themselves, because digital participation has got to be more than essential skills, and the digital participation charter has secured commitment from over 500 public, private and third, third sector organisations to work together. What's the role of digital companies? Jamie Green. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, much of the conversation around uh, big digital companies and, and the way that they've transformed uh, uh, our economies uh, is immense. We often talk about them in terms simply of their, their taxation or their employment opportunities. They actually have a, a fundamental role to play in how people uh, communicate, learn uh, and discover. Uh, so I think they have a huge responsibility. I won't name some of the platforms and organisations, but I think they know who they are, uh, as do we. I think you're right. Um, they have a huge responsibility too to understand that, that large portions of society are now using uh, digital platforms to not just uh, purchase goods, but also access information uh, and, and to use it to, to contact each other and interact with each other in a way that they never did before. And I think how they use that responsibility is key, uh, some uh, clearly better than others. Um, I think uh, I would like to focus in the short time we have here to focus on skills. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an important point. We, we do often talk about infrastructure uh, in terms of pure connectivity and whose responsibility it was or is and how much money should or shouldn't have been spent Ben, I think it's fair to say that infrastructure is incredibly hard to deliver in rural parts of any country, uh, especially if we are going to reach uh, the sort of speeds that we need uh, in our rural uh, community and island communities. I mean, these are very technically difficult areas to uh, deliver to. I think that's an admission 
on all parts. But again, as I said in, in one of my interventions, is what do you do with that infrastructure once you have it? If one-fifth of the population do not have access to basic digital skills, there is a serious conversation as to how we address that. Over 11 million people across the UK do not have the basic digital skills they need. So if the digital economy is the economy of the future, then surely that one-fifth needs to reduce to zero. Uh, a survey from Citizens Advice Scotland found that half of all respondents, 50% of respondents to their survey, could not do simple things such as download, complete, save, or upload electronic forms. I think we should be mindful about that when we think about how we develop online platforms to access public services, such as uh, benefits and welfare services or health-related services. If people simply cannot download, complete, and upload basic forms and are still relying on paper-based or face-to-face, -face, then something clearly is not working. If I could put a quick plug in for some of the good work being done in my part of the world, in North Ayrshire, uh, Women's Aid has been helping people uh, in a whole uh, number of ways to improve their digital skills. And the results of that have included things like helping them access, for example, their universal credit uh, journals or to job search. And in one uh, example, I was shared uh, somebody who uh, was able to access um, some voluntary uh, roles and that uh, work experience helped her uh, achieve paid employment. Uh, so I think just in closing, uh, it's really important we think about why uh, we need digital inclusion. People without digital inclusion have poorer health outcomes than others. They have increased loneliness and social iso isolation and they have less job and educational opportunities. They pay more for essentials, they're financially excluded and there is an increased risk of falling into poverty. They also lack a voice and visibility in modern society. So government services and democracy must always think about how it delivers to people online and digitally. I think that itself sums up why schemes such as Clever Cogs deserve both cross-party support and it is a good start, but more needs to be done. Thank you. Uh, I know Mr Stevenson can finish up to six minutes rather than just beyond. So Stuart Stevenson followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and let me declare my membership of the Association for Computing Machinery, membership of the Institution of Engineering and Technology, and I'm a fellow of the Royal Society for Arts, Manufactures and Commerce, all of which have interests uh, in this area. Uh, the history of uh, this subject goes back a very long way. Uh, the Romans uh, communicated across their empire nearly 2,000 years ago digitally by a system of hilltop signaling, uh, but now we're in the electronic world. But even some of the things that we're interested in today uh, go back a lot further than we might think, and I go back beyond the birth date of two participants in the debate so far to 1964, when the uh, MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory Yes, you think it's modern artificial intelligence. That was 54 years ago. Uh, Joseph uh, Wein Weizenbaum pre produced a program called ELISA, which was designed to answer questions in a way that you could not tell whether it was a human or a computer who answered them. And very successfully, he did so too. And we've from that point onwards, we've always said it will be five years before artificial intelligence takes over from us. And it's still five years away today. So in computing, things can take a good deal longer than we sometimes would like uh, or imagine. And just picking up what Donald, Donald Cameron said, I've gone to the Audit Scotland report, and the exact words are not as Donald Cameron suggested. They say, the Scottish Government achieved its initial target to provide fibre access to 95% of premises. Oh. Its more recent reaching 100% ambition will be more difficult to realise. And I acknowledge that's certainly, cer I really don't have time, sorry, certainly <laughs> going to be uh, true. Um, it, it also says it might cost more than 600 million, but of course, we'll see how it, yeah, yeah. it, 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 turns, it turns out. And, and Mike Rumbles is not wholly wrong when he talks about some of the difficulties in Aberdeenshire. Uh, in Aberdeenshire and in Frisia, we've got a huge number of exchange-only lines, which for the current uh, program of how we do the technology means we can't readily be attached uh, to fibre. I said uh, 40 years ago nearly, the triumph of computers will be achieved when we no longer realize we're using one. In other words, we speak to them and they just do what we ask them. 
and we will reach that point probably in my lifetime. And at that point, digital exclusion will become a, a different kind of animal. Lots of people can't work keyboards. Lots of people find the complexities of the particular interactions with computers are very difficult to achieve. And I think it's absolutely the case that we need, right across Scotland, we need to have ways in which people, and perhaps those uh, who are over uh, 75 in, in particular, uh, where 70% of people over 75 don't use the internet, uh, triple the Scottish average, we need people to help those uh, achieve the kind of access uh, to the internet that matters to them. Now, it matters economically because when you use the modern systems for your daily life, it's estimated you save nearly 600 pounds a year. So economically it's that. Communicating with your friends and relatives in other villages, in other parts of the island we live on, and in other places around the world uh, is now very electronic. And if you deny that opportunity, that is a huge uh, loss in your life. Now, for people with particular disadvantages, be they physical, mental, or whatever, um, the computer can be uh, a way out of those difficulties. Myself and two pals, Alistair McPherson and Robert Davidson, we built the first home computer in Scotland in 1975. And a couple of years later, uh, we were able to adapt an Apple II computer for a quadriplegic uh, ex-soldier who'd had an accident in the tank that he commanded and was left totally crippled. He could move his head. That was all we could do. We were able to rig up a bit of kit, change the way the keyboard worked, and develop something he could hold in his mouth to tap at the keyboard. And within two months, he was actually writing programs that he was selling. And I, I felt terrific about that. Unfortunately, his health problems eventually uh, overwhelmed him. Today, we've got much more powerful computers that can do so much uh, more for us. And therefore, the exclusion can become wider than it was when there was little computers. Uh, because, of course, those who master the new technology can stride off over the horizon much further away from those who have not been able to do so. So I think uh, we should recognize that the phones and computers that we use are absolutely vital uh, to our world. One of the things that uh, Unisys said a couple of years ago, one of the computer firms, it takes 26 hours on average for a person to re report a lost wallet, but only 68 minutes to report they've lost their cell phone. And that tells us something about how important uh, technology uh, now is in our lives. And uh, Jamie Green talked about 20% of adults, I think the number of has 20% of adults in the most disadvantaged 20% of Scotland are not using the internet. And they're the people who, for a whole host of reasons, are deprived of many things the rest of us take for granted, whom we need to have people in libraries and public spaces that are going to help people access publicly uh, available computers. And I hope that the, uh, the government, in looking at the comments from this debate and at the opportunities that come from digital uh, rollout, we'll look at that particular uh, matter in future. Presiding Officer. Rhoda Grant, followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to welcome Kate Forbes to her new post and her constituency should inform her that all is not well with digital connectivity. And I'm not sure it augurs well either for this debate um, that the government motion cited a report that wasn't available in hard copy far less digitally when they tabled their motion um, this week. And maybe this reflects their digital policy, great aspirations, but little delivery. Since we last debated digital inclusion, I feel we have made very little progress. The issues are the same, rural areas left behind as our urban deprived communities, and this sadly follows historic exclusion. We had the opportunity to do something different with digital connectivity. We could have used it to bridge the social exclusion divide, but unfortunately, it appears to have deepened that divide. The Scottish Government did not have the same ambition for rural and urban Scotland. The target of 95% reach for urban Scotland and 75% reach for rural Scotland starkly states that lack of ambition. So therefore, we're not at the forefront of the digital revolution. Sadly, we are lagging behind. 
They tell us that this will be addressed by R100. And sadly, I don't believe that that, that is the case. And the, those in the industry tell us that there will still be communities that will not be reached by R100. The little support well, that, that was... If I can just make this point. Um, the little support that was available previously to rural communities has been withdrawn as we wait for R100. We are at a hiatus where the tender, while the tendering process takes place. And surely this tendering process could have been um, carried out while the previous rollout was still running to stop, um, to stop the rollout for any length of time is surely not good enough. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, the member says people in the industry are telling us R100 can't be done. I recently met BT, one of the bidders, not the only one I understand, and had absolute assurances that we can reach 100. Price is a different issue. Can she tell me who is saying that we can't reach 100 per cent? Rhoda Grant. Uh, many, uh, B, yes, indeed, B, BT, BT are part of, of those. But many people in the industry are saying there's not the technology available to reach 100% of the population. However, there are things that the Scottish Government could be doing now to make a difference. They could be mapping fibre, especially fibre that has been paid for by the public purse. R100 will see the public purse pay for new fibre to be laid over the top of fibre that the public purse has already paid for. The government needs to keep ownership of all the fibre that they have funded so that subsequent upgrades and rollouts can use the same. They also need to trace that which was historically laid to save money to make sure that we use all public investment in this area. And it would also make sense to map fibre that is privately owned to see if that can be utilised to speed out the roll, speed up the rollout of broadband. We also need to give small communities access to afford, affordable backhaul and indeed make sure R100 doesn't undermine any of that because commercial rates are far too high and prohibit community solutions and again um, this is something that can be investigated right now. We need to make sure that the rollout uh, doesn't compromise current community solutions and if you take for example SSE have been laying fibre for the MOD over in Applecross. An additional cable has been laid at the same time, which will be commercially available to bring superfast broadband to parts of Applecross. Applecross have their own broadband system, AppleNet. It's not superfast and it can be unreliable due to weather conditions, but it is there. It's there now providing a service as cheaply as possible to the whole community. If a larger provider buys access to the new uh, fibre, they will be able to provide fast, reliable and cheaper broadband to the easy to reach parts of that community. If that happens and these customers are lost to AppleNet, may well become unsustainable, meaning that most of the community will have no broadband at all. The public purse through the MOD is paying to put down that fibre that has the potential of undermining a community's access to broadband. What should happen is that the community system be given access to that fibre at an affordable price. Then it would be able to upgrade for the whole community, making it faster and more reliable. And it's areas such as these that have most to benefit from digital connectivity. Who would want to live who wouldn't want to live in such a beautiful place, but employment in rural areas is hard to find. Better digital connectivity would allow people to work from anywhere, as well as making it easier for new businesses to start up. And this connectivity could make these people and places and communities far more financially viable. I've concentrated most of my comments on remote rural issues, as you would expect, given my constituency. However, as I previously said, unequal access to connectivity follows the lines of traditional inequalities. Those in deprived communities suffer the same issue with access as those in our remote rural communities. It's not commercially viable for private profit-driven companies to provide them with broadband because they can't afford to pay for it. We need to find solutions to these issues, making sure that those communities don't fall behind. Presiding officer, we're a long way from equal access to connectivity. It's no longer a nice add-on. It's an essential service, and we need to provide it. I call Willie Coffey to be followed by Jamie Halcro-Johnson. 
Thank you, President Officer. When I was a young graduate of computer science in the early 1980s, only a decade or so after the technology was in place that took us to the moon, we could still only dream of the possibility that everyone in the world could potentially contact, see and speak to anyone else in the world in real time at any time. Potentially is the key word here because while the technology is there to enable such an amazing thing as this, the people aren't quite there in terms of their ability to access and use that technology. And that's what I hope the theme of the debate is about, bringing all our people along in this digital train journey so that no one is left behind at the station as it speeds faster and faster ahead. Yes, we need the technology to be up to the task. We need the connectivity to enable it all to work. We need skilled people to put it all together and make it easy for all of us to use. And we need governments to be thinking about how best to sell the tickets so that everyone can have a seat in the train, no matter what their circumstances are. Uh, I make my usual plea at this point, President Officer, for any of our young potential graduates of the future to think seriously about a career in software development. We are short of thousands of software developers in Scotland, and it's good software that is the key to the success of all of this. So it's happening to see that the government's digital strategy paper has this in mind. It's essential, in fact. Technology in isolation takes us nowhere. So we need people with the skills to enable the rest of us to use it easily. It's a wonderful career for young graduates to consider. The potential to work anywhere in the world, but hopefully Scotland, never the same day twice in a row, well paid and a career that can last a lifetime too. We know that there are bigger vacancy rates in the digital economy than in other sectors, with less than four out of 10 businesses in Scotland reporting that they have the right digital skills in place to meet those requirements. So the government strategy is crucial here in trying to help. The Digital Growth Fund and the pilot project in Edinburgh to help businesses scale up their digital capabilities will, will certainly help. But I would like to see that extended to all parts of Scotland, including Ayrshire, since, as we know, it takes far too long for my constituents to get to Edinburgh on a real train, never mind on a digital train, but that's another debate for another time. We really need to see more young undergraduates and especially more young women choosing software degrees to make any of this possible. It's going up slowly, but not fast enough yet. In European terms, and without politicising this point too much, we know that the digital single market is fundamental to Scotland's place in a digitally competitive Europe. It's worth about 400 billion euros per year and supports hundreds of thousands of jobs. In my view, it's impossible to leave that market despite the rhetoric that we hear. And it's crucial that our government finds ways to keep Scotland in that market. Otherwise, we as a nation risk exclusion and isolation from it. And we can't allow that to happen. In terms of wider inclusion issues, I'm delighted to have convened the Parliament's cross-party group on digital participation for a, a number of years. There, we've heard some really positive stories of how communities right across Scotland have been embracing technology and trying to broaden its appeal and relevance to as many citizens as possible. We've heard from community broadband projects that are working well from housing associations who offer innovative and affordable solutions for tenants, from small businesses who rely on fast data access to reach out directly to a wider client base than they might otherwise be able to afford to contact, and from local initiatives across a number of councils who do some great work in that really important area of providing access to and demystifying the technology, particularly for our older citizens many of whom still remain sceptical and even suspicious about technology. My own council in East Ayrshire is doing some great work through their digital participation network to assess all the skills gaps in communities wherever they are and to provide lots of support opportunities for everyone. They know the importance of reaching out and bringing people along in this digital journey that I mentioned earlier. President Officer, we'll probably never reach the end of this digital journey that we're so locked into in this modern society. New and ever more exciting technological achievements are bound only by our imagination. And the value our citizens see in all of this depends on our ability 
and willingness to make it easy for everyone to share the possibilities that come from it. The great Alan Turing said, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. A wonderful reminder for us, I think, about the challenges ahead for all of us as we seek to build a digital society for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Coffey. I call Jamie Halker Johnson, be followed by Richard Lyle. Mr. Halker Johnson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I also welcome Kate Forbes to her role uh, as a new minister and as a Highlander? It's good to have somebody who will have shared the many frustrations <laughs> a lot of us in the Highlands and Islands will have felt when uh, using the internet. Um, as we've already heard today, digital connectivity touches the lives of an increasing number of Scots and in an ever-increasing number of ways. So I welcome the Carnegie Trust's work in this area and the light that's been cast on those who have been left out. In its 2016 report, the trust, out, the trust set out some of its initial evidence about digital exclusion. And we can see clearly the concentration of that exclusion in certain sectors of society, as well as some of the consequences and outcomes that this has. This has been a press, pressing issue in the Highlands and Islands for some time, as the Minister will be aware. For many communities in remote and rural areas of Scotland, digital inclusion remains little more than an aspiration. To quote the Carnegie Trust, many of those groups who are currently digitally excluded could benefit disproportionately from the benefits of being online. This is an important conclusion. It is especially true in areas that are distant from public services, where there is a dependence on goods being delivered and where isolation can be a problem. It is some of these groups I'd like to turn my attention this afternoon. I'm pleased that the motion touches on employability, as the evidence shows that digital inclusion is at some of its lowest levels at the lowest paid end of the socio-economic scale. There can be no doubt that skills, uh, digital skills are of huge benefit in finding good quality work in our modern economy and are now invaluable transferable skills in a range of jobs. The internet is also increasingly where people go to look for jobs and the online services offered by agencies like Job Centre Plus make finding job, uh, jobs increasingly convenient. In its programme for government earlier this year, the Scottish Government committed to greater support for retraining hopefully recognising to some degree that the nature of employment and the careers is changing. However, if we reflect on how people access retraining opportunities and how they keep their skills up to date, there is a worrying conclusion here, that if the skills gap remains unaddressed, the gap in reskilling and adaptability in the labour market at the lowest ends of the income scale will, scale will grow too. An economy where the lowest earners are excluded from these opportunities is not a fair economy. And for older people too, there are considerable advantages to being connected. At the weekend, many will have read in the newspapers that only 16% of care homes across the United Kingdom have Wi-Fi available to all re uh, residents. I would assume the figure for Scotland would be broadly similar. At present, a number of care homes use Wi-Fi uh, in various ways to improve residents' lives, bridging geography by arranging video calls between residents and their families, for example. However, the demand in this sector will only grow. And older people living in their own homes will also increasingly look towards digital connectivity to provide entertainment and the power, uh, the power to ra uh, uh, power the range of consumer devices that are available. And its impact can also be more apparent when we look at the provision of support to some older people. In some cases, internet-connected monitoring devices can provide help to people with dementia to allow them to live independently for longer. My colleague Donald Cameron spoke in his opening speech about some of the educational work that is taking place, utilising digital technology on Scotland's islands communities, and the Western Isles in particular. In addition to the education opportunities this brings, we also see in the Western Isles how digital can provide support to our local linguistic and cultural heritage. Parts of my region are also heavily dependent on tourism, whether we think of Speyside, Scotland's whisky capital in Murray, or the attractions of my own home area of Orkney an expansion of digital services can offer real opportunities. The work that goes into supporting small local businesses to get online pays dividends, and it also provides a low-cost avenue for bodies like Visit Scotland to attract and inform visitors. Yet many businesses, particularly in the island communities like Orkney and Shetland, are small. For them, the barriers to fully embracing a digital society are higher. What we must ensure is that the Highlands and Islands does not find itself at a competitive disadvantage. In referring back to the words of the Carnegie Trust, it is these communities where digital exclusion will have the greatest benefits. D -d -d sorry, digital inclusion will have the greatest benefits. That is why I have been repeatedly disappointed when broad that when broadband rollout is taking place, it is these same communities that I have mentioned who often appear to be at the bottom of the queue. This leaves a geographical concentration of digital exclusion, 
Indeed, we know well that the Highlands Alliance has many of the very worst areas in the entire United Kingdom for, na for connectivity. And that's not a legacy to be proud of. In March last year, the responsible cabinet secretary said that economic success demands that our ability to benefit from digital is not limited by where we choose to live or work. That's a fine aspiration, but it's far from the experience felt by many of my constituents. Presiding officer, as the Scottish government looks forward to the future of its, uh, uh, to the future of its work on digital inclusion, it is clear that across many parts of Scotland, people face varying levels of multiple exclusion. The reality, of course, is that much of the expansion in digital inclusion has come from the private sector, as the growth in connected devices has been consumer-driven. In the past 20 years, exploiting the potential of digital technology has moved from desktop into people's pockets, on their televisions, even through devices on their kitchen counter. It is becoming far more accessible. But still, there remains an excluded minority that, is, that it is challenging to reach. The first priority must be to make digital connectivity available. In my region, we have found ourselves lagging behind when it is clear that the timing of rollout is vitally important. So I ask us to look, look, at, to, to look not at the challenges and costs, but to the opportunities, the potential for economic growth, for higher pay, and for reducing isolation, and for personalizing public services, and for improving living standards. Thank you. I call Richard Lyle, followed by James Kelly. Thank Mr. you, President Officer. Please. Can I begin my remarks this afternoon by welcoming the opportunity to contribute to this debate in a digital society for all and thank my colleague, the Minister, for bringing forward the debate which provides us an opportunity to talk about the record of this government on delivering digital participation and thus providing better access to fair work, higher wage jobs. Jobs being the key priority for me when I considered, considered my election to this place. President Officer, I wish that whilst we're on the issue of digital inclusion to consider the issue of broadband and whilst I know that many in the chamber may think that we know all about broadband you never know or you have to see uh, your grandchildren showing you how to access Peppa Pig or robot transformers you'll forgive me for that aside I sounded a bit like my friend Stuart Stevenson for a moment there but in an answer to my esteemed colleague Mr Stevenson last week the Minister Paul Hulhouse outlined the around broadband universal service obligation commitments that the Scottish Government has repeatedly urged the UK Government to match Scotland's ambition and set the broadband universal service obligation at 30 megabytes per second, which would help to deliver the super fast broadband connections to our rural communities, not the 10 megabytes that they have proposed. Indeed, Scotland is the only part of the UK to have committed to extending super fast access to 100% of premises, supported by initial procurement of 600 million. The Minister outlined that despite numerous requests and despite the regulation, legislation of telecommunications being wholly reserved, reserved to the UK Parliament, the UK Government has contributed a mere 3.5% of that investment with the Scottish Government, committing 96.5%. Colleagues will therefore understand why I was perplexed when, during a visit, to my son's house in Aboyne, Aberdeenshire, over the summer, summer recess, that a letter was received from the local Conservative Member of Parliament, Mr Andrew Bowie. First wrong thing, he didn't even have the goodness to put my son's name on the letter. In the letter, Mr Bowie stated, the overwhelming concern for those I speak with were the changes to the local bus services in, Aber in Aberdeen. And wait for it, and this is where I laughed, the lack of broadband provision in the area. Mr Bowie then on, went on to state that he had been in constant communication with both Openreach and Digital Scotland with a view to receive more information when better provision will be provided. My son's broadband and FaceTime and tele, uh, telephone access is excellent. I think perhaps Mr Bowie should be a better place writing to his colleagues in the U Conservative UK Government and ask them when they'll help to foot the bill for the investment in this area. And indeed, in his own words, when better provision will be provided. I hope that Mr Bowie and the Conservative colleagues in Westminster, and indeed Holyrood, will start to remember that this is a reserved area, and they should get on with a day job and help this SNP Scottish Government deliver for all of Scotland. And on the topic of remote and rural communities, presiding officer, it's clear that in order to bring accessibility and sustainable Wi-Fi 
to these communities, then we have to require innovative ideas that will require us to support wider thinking about potential solutions. One such company that I've been engaged with over the course of the last many months, and their ideas are innovative and exactly the type of solution-based approach that we will require to move forward. Their idea is to have lamp posts coupled with self-sustainable electricity through new renewables that will also act as Wi-Fi connection points for communities in Scotland. This type of wider uh, thinking is exactly what is required if we wish to meet the challenges that we face in the delivery of digital inclusion for all. Indeed, these challenges are one which this government has recognised and are working to address, having just last year published its digital strategy, which set out how the Scottish Government intends to place digital at the heart of everything it does, from reforming public services to delivering economic growth. This included the creation of conditions which lead to 150,000 working and digital technology jobs across Scotland by the start of the next decade. Again, jobs, as my colleague uh, Willie Coffey spoke about, being the key focus of our work. To ensure that every premise in Scotland is able to access broadband speeds of at least 300 megabytes, 30 megabytes by 2021, as I've already mentioned. All the while against the drop, drop, backdrop of funding and investment through a new digital school programme, new digital growth fund, around the funding for community digital inclusion projects and the expansion of Scotland's digital partition charter. Presiding officer, closing the digital divide in Scotland will positively impact social cohesion, improve both social and economic inclusion. That's a fact. It's a sad fact that digital inequalities are more likely to be experienced by those who are already more likely to be disadvantaged according to their measures. Indeed, in Scotland, the digital divide remains along a number of dimensions, including age and socio-economic deprivation. For example, 26% of adults living in 20% of most deprived areas in Scotland reported not using the internet compared with 16% in the rest of the country. That's over one in four. And further concern is that 70% of those aged 75 do not use the internet. Presiding officer, closing the digital divide is crucial to the future of the Affair of Scotland, and I'm proud to support this government, which is doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call James Kelly to be followed by Bill Kidd. Mr Kelly, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think the, the advance of technology is probably the, the biggest thing that's uh, happened, or one of the biggest things that's happened in, in my lifetime. When I reflect back to 1981, when I was a computer information systems student at Glasgow College of Technology, and to get your computer program into the college mainframe, you first of all had to write the program out on coding sheets, which were then keyed on to, to cards by a keyboard operator and the cards then fed through into the, into the mainframe before your computer program could actually be uh, compiled. And then if it came back with a pile of errors, you had to go through the process again. Um, so it's quite astonishing when, you know, now you look at that real advance in technology, you know, back then in 1981, for example, when people went on holiday, they, they sent postcards home. Uh, now when people go on holiday, they immediately take photographs and they can share them on Facebook or WhatsApp and people back home and throughout the world can instantly see um, them, in, them enjoying their holiday. It's also great for uh, people in education. You know, you've got a whole wealth of information there on the internet that helps uh, students and uh, those just looking to, to better themselves in terms of acquiring more knowledge. Uh, as many in the debate have said, it saves people money uh, when people are purchasing goods and services. Uh, they're able to compare uh, rates use it, using uh, the technology available. So there have been tremendous ad advances made, um, but it would be easy to, to sit back and, uh, you know, and sort of reflect in the, the glow of that and think everything's fine. But the reality is there's a lot going on in the country that means that people don't have access to that technology. Um, I mean, if I look at uh, a ward near, near where I stay, rather going central and north, 28.26% of children are living in uh, poverty households in that ward. Indeed, over Canvas Lang and Rutherglen, there are over 3,000 
uh, children living, living in poverty households. So a lot of those households uh, will not have access to the sort of technology that people have spoken about uh, during the case of the debate. And this was brought home to me when as part of Challenge Poverty Week, uh, I recently visited the Whitlerburn Hub and it's an excellent facility providing IT uh, support facilities to people that don't have IT access. And there was a lot of people there simply couldn't afford computers, tablets or the type of phones. And they needed the facility because they, they required IT accounts in order to access properly the benefits system or to try and get back into work. They were developing CVs and the CV support and the IT support there was very beneficial. But the people using that facility were locked out from, from information, information technology. I think the other point we need to bear in mind is the the role that's played by uh, big business IT providers in excluding people from the, the digital world. What a lot of them do is they set up kind of long, try to lock people into longer term contracts that involve you know, substantial financial commitments. They also bundle up a number of, uh, of facilities and try and lock people in. Some pe times people get locked into these contracts and then maybe can't afford them and, and run into debt uh, and run out. Um, other, <coughs> other people just simply can't afford a, a long-term and an expensive contract like that. Research by the University of Harvard demonstrated that uh, there's a real benefit in community-owned information technology uh, providers. And indeed, there's, there's one, again, uh, near to where I stay in Whitlerburn, the Whitlerburn Housing Co-op uh, have, have their own communications co-op that they set up and that uh, they, they provide access in terms of much shorter bundles uh, so that people can access technology for only a week at a time and uh, access has gone up over the period that that techno technology co-op has been in place from 39% uh, to 80%. Um, so that shows the, you know, the, the, the massive reach that a local uh, housing co-op, you know, com community-based uh, information IT facility can have. So um, I think there's a lot to be, that needs to be done to take this area forward. Uh, what I would say is that there are clearly major policy cha challenges around the number of people that are in poverty, the number of people you know, doing two and three jobs that don't have enough money to access the sort of facilities that we've been talking about. That's part of a wider debate that will take place in the budget. Uh, I'd ur urge the, the new minister, and I wish her well, uh, in her endeavours to do more in terms of lobbying uh, big business IT providers to provide uh, better and lower cost uh, packages in order to get more people into IT. And I think we should also do more to support community solutions. There's a lot, there's a lot has been ad advanced in this area, but there's a lot still to be done. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. I call Bill Kidd to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. And Mr. Balfour, we have the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Kidd, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And in welcoming Kate Forbes to her new role, um, I would like to thank her very much for bringing this topic forward for debate. <clears throat> and I've noted. Uh, with interest how much of the motion being debated today highlights the impact of digital technologies on people with a range of disabilities. This is an important topic as it recognises how technology has the capacity to transform lives. That's something to be embraced and something to be celebrated. New te digital technologies like assistive technology, for example, can allow people with disabilities to access work at all levels of employment. As we become a more digitally focused society, it's important to consider how technology can help people with disabilities, whether this be a physical or a learning disability. And today, I would like to focus on uh, one particular way in which I think technology has the capacity to improve the lives of uh, dyslexic people, particularly whilst in higher education. Dyslexia Scotland estimates that one in 10 people are dyslexic in some way, that's over half a million people in Scotland. 
Dyslexia is genetic and commonly runs in families, and whilst it is commonly known as a learning difficulty, it also has many abilities attached. Dyslexics tend to be very good problem solvers, innovative thinkers, and also artistically or musically talented. Research shows that an equal number of boys and girls have dyslexia, so it's not something that's gender specific. Research has also found that UK entrepreneurs are five times more likely to have dyslexia than the average UK citizen. But despite all this, learning can be very challenging at times, as the dyslexic way of thinking often doesn't fit in. In 2017, the organisation made by dyslexia produced research showing that nine out of 10 dyslexic individuals said that this condition had made them feel angry, stupid or embarrassed. The frustration that can come whilst at school or university as a dyslexic can damage a student's self-efficacy. By self-efficacy, I refer to a student or pupil's belief in their ability to achieve and how this can make them not aim as high in their work and therefore affects their grade. Amongst many other factors, a dyslexic student's frustration commonly comes from taking sometimes three times longer to read and comprehend a passage of text. So I want to emphasize a simple example of how technology has the potential to transform the experience of dyslexics in higher education. Online academic texts can be made available in dyslexia-friendly fonts. It's not an earth-shattering change and it doesn't require upheaval to make it happen. And as education becomes increasingly available online, whether this is through online modules or academic texts accessed by digital libraries, there is new potential for education providers to make learning accessible in ways not previously possible. The idea of creating a mechanism for books or articles to be read in a dyslexic-friendly font isn't a new one. It's already been adopted commercially. And perhaps one of the most significant adoptions of dyslexic-friendly fonts has come from Kindle. Almost all of Kindle's books are available to read in a dyslexia-friendly font. Microsoft Word also has the open dyslexic font type available for people to use on their computers at home or at work. And this means that if you download something in Word format rather than PDF, then you can change the font manually yourself. The United Nations are an organization which allows treaties and documents to be downloaded in Word format rather than PDF, which allows people to make appropriate changes should they be deemed required. The Scottish Government's digital strategy is a promising one. It highlights that digital technology is to be at the heart of everything it does, and the strategy goes on to promote cross-sector collaboration in the adoption of digital technologies. I welcome the consideration of the impact of digital technologies on people with a range of disabilities, and I would like to encourage those working within our leading education sectors to consider what changes can be made to help students with disabilities of whatever nature to engage and contribute to the best of their abilities. In conjunction with digital libraries like JSTOR, our Scottish universities have the capacity to make one small change that could have a transformational life and transformational impact of life for dyslexic students. And it's very important we use technology to the best advantage possible. It's there, it can be used, and I very much support the Scottish Government's direction to do so. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Jeremy Balfour. Then we move to closing speeches. Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. And can I also... Uh, welcome Kate Forbes to her new role. A digital society is a good thing and one that we are striving to become. But until we become a digitally, a digitally inclusive society, we will be failing. And the key word is that we have to be inclusive to all here in Scotland. Digital inclusion describes people's ability to gain access to digital technology and perhaps most importantly, and understand how to use it. Um, I attended an event uh, last night, uh, which the minister was speaking at, and it left me 
sitting there thinking, I have not got a scooby of most of the things they are talking about. So you can go to something, you can look at it, you can press buttons, but unless we understand how to use it, then frankly, we haven't made much progress. But at a very basic level, more and more is done online. We pay our bills online. We get public policy online. We get application forms online. We do our shopping online. And all, th all these things are good in themselves. And we've heard uh, this afternoon from other members about perhaps geographical issues and other problems people face in regard to getting access and inclusion to digital material. But can I suggest, wherever you live in Scotland, if you are disabled or if you are elderly, then you have a greater challenge than the rest of society. The Centre for Age and Better found that over 55s made up 94% of non-internet users. That is a startling figure, and a figure that is likely to grow unless we address it quickly. So what can we do to address some of these issues? Well, I think firstly we need to have proper access. For most of us, we will have our computers at home. We will have our iPhones in our pocket. But for those who are elderly, for those who are disabled, often that is not an option. And unless we have access to the equipment, um, then we will simply fail. But also, even if you have access to the issue, you then need to have the confidence and the training to use it. And for people who have disability, for people who are elderly, that can often be a big challenge. But I think we can overcome some of those challenges. Um, I think computers can open up things, particularly for disabled people that simply weren't there before. Things like uh, Dragon, Dragon, where you can speak onto the computer, opens up access to people who find it difficult to type or use a keyboard. Um, and I think we need to look at whether the right people are getting use of that software. Uh, for me, it has revolutionized the way I can do emails and write speeches and correspond with people. Rather than having to type all the time, I simply speak into the computer. Unfortunately, it still often comes out as gibberish, but that's mine and not the computer's fault. But these kind of things are basic, comparatively cheap, but again, a lot of people in society are simply not getting access to it. I think there are good examples, and we've heard some from the ministers and from others, about engaging with older people. Here in Edinburgh, um, a project has been run in care homes which is called Moose in the Hoose. That project uh, is an IT outreach project for older people living in care homes. And in five care homes here in Edinburgh, on a weekly basis, basis volunteers go in and encourage and help those within the home to use the internet, email, and Skype. And particularly older people who perhaps families don't live here in Edinburgh anymore, it's an opportunity on a regular basis to catch up with children, grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren. So I think there are challenges ahead. I think there are opportunities. And I think both governments, both here north and south of the border, need to work together. But perhaps the overriding message is for us to say we shouldn't be scared of digital technology. We should encourage people to use it but we need to give them the training and the confidence to do that. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you very much. I call Colin Smith to close for Labour, up to seven minutes, Mr Smith. Now, you haven't got your microphone on. Your card's an upside down. Just change consoles. Spare card, please, for Mr. Smith.
It would happen in a digital debate, wouldn't it? <laughs> you couldn't plan it. Time up. <laughs> <laughs> You, you now have six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, won't, I, I won't accuse anyone of, of switching me off halfway through or even before I get, I get started. It's usually at the end, uh, presiding officer, before you, you, you cut me off. But today's debate, um, give or take the odd technological fault, has made clear, I think, the importance of digital inclusion. I think there's been a real unity of purpose in seeing some of the barriers that far too many people in our society face when it comes to benefiting from the technological revolution. That revolution impacts on every aspect of society and every aspect of our lives, which is changing as a result of digitisation. In the opening, in opening the debate and in the government's motion, Kate Forms highlighted the Carnegie Trust report, Living Digitally, an evaluation of the Clever Clogs digital care and support system. It gave us a glimpse into the potentially transformative effect of digital inclusion on health and social care. That pilot showed an increase in digital participation amongst those using the Clever Clogs and clearly illustrates the wider benefits of digital participation. It suggests the use of Clever Clogs resulted in improved overall mental well-being with participants recording higher average life satisfaction, increased happiness and decreased Boredom. It also showed improved self-management of health conditions amongst participants, with some indicators suggesting improved independence more broadly. But the project also highlighted the help for those working in the health and social care sector, showing that staff using Clever Clogs saved an average of approximately five minutes per visit and time spent on administrative tasks. The report concludes that the system holds promise for reaching those with the most entrenched digital exclusion and improving their quality of life. This is just one example of how utilising new technology and support and digital engagement can help to deliver person-centred care and improve wellbeing within the health and social care sector. Emma Harper also highlighted another initiative in healthcare the Attend Anywhere initiative. In communities right across Scotland, innovative, locally-led work such as this has taken place to improve digital participation and inclusion. SCVO have been doing some invaluable work supporting these types of projects right across Scotland. They provided £1.6 million worth of funding to 169 local projects. They've also received a commitment to tackling digital exclusion from 600 organisations from across the public, private and third sectors as part of their digital participation charter. In my own region, Trust Housing Association has been working with NCVO to deliver the aims of the digital participation charter across their local services. One resident, a 78-year-old woman who was initially sceptical about efforts to promote digital learning, is now regularly using her iPad and has said it has helped reduce feelings of isolation and boredom. Another resident was having trouble accessing information on her iPad and while staff weren't able to help, a fellow resident managed to solve the problem. This illustrates how digital learning can help promote independence, but also foster a sense of community. These modern, innovative projects have huge potential across a range of policy areas, and I welcome the Scottish Government's role in supporting them. But as the debate has shown, this needs to be supported by the necessary infrastructure. And speaker after speaker highlighted the fact that at present, that infrastructure is simply not yet fit for purpose. Now, we all agree with the aims of the R100 programme, which learns from the weaknesses of the previous programme and not setting minimum speeds for everyone. Now, Patrick Harvey may be happy with his internet speed in the centre of Glasgow, where he, he seems to love nothing more than whirling around Google Earth. But if he visits many rural parts of my region, I can tell him the only whirling around people have when it comes to broadband is the red circle on the screen when they try to load a programme on Netflix, but don't have the internet speed to do so. R100 aims to tackle this, but as Rhoda Grant highlighted, we're still waiting to see an overall strategy for delivering genuine 100% coverage at those speeds we want, and in particular, there are still no details on the planned intervention scheme. If 100% is possible, then the Scottish Government needs to provide details of how this will be achieved and needs to clearly map out their planned timeline of activity as soon as possible after the procurement process has concluded. But as the debate also highlighted, accessibility is not just a matter of coverage. If we are to genuinely advance digital inclusion, we must also consider 
how to improve affordability and ensure everyone has the necessary skills to make use of the technology when it is available. James Kelly in particular highlighted the barriers people in his area face, but crucially the many local initiatives to break down those barriers and the need to expand those solutions. Bill Kidd also highlighted the fact that those with disabilities can face exclusion and again set out how technological initiatives can break down some of those barriers, transforming the lives of those with dyslexia. And Jeremy Balfour talked very personally how, about how technology helped him break down some of those barriers, even if no one distracted from the fact he said he still talks gibberish. It was, however, a very positive example of how to use digitization to redress inequalities. But should, but, but that's why, sorry, I'm signed off, sir. That's why the rollout of R100, breaking down these barriers is so important, ensuring that people on low incomes, those faced with disabilities, and those who do not have access to internet and broadband speeds are supported to make sure those barriers are broken down. Thank you. Thank you and well recovered, Mr. Smith. I call on Finlay Carson to pose the Conservatives. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr. Carson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to close the debate today and I, like others, welcome Minister Kate Forbes into her new role, a role that I'm pleased to shadow. We've already had positive discussions other than who's got the most beautiful constituency uh, and I, I look forward to, to future similar meetings. In the words of the founder of the World Economic Forum, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work and relate to one another. In its scope, scale and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. We do not yet know how it will unfold, but one thing is clear, the response to it must be integrated and comprehensively involve all stakeholders of the global polity and the public and private sectors to academia and civil society. However, unless we take urgent action, the dawn of the digital age will not be coming soon to a small town near you. And that's clearly seen in my constituency as in Galloway and Western Fries. The lack of reliable digital connectivity remains one of the biggest issues. I don't often agree with Patrick Harvey, but in this case, he's absolutely spot on. It's not the lack of super fast speeds, but simply the lack of reliability. But we know that super fast fiber broadband will deliver much improved reliability. It will deliver a network that we can depend on to deliver the information and services that we need. We constantly hear in debates in this chamber and elsewhere about the speeds which the two governments want to commit to. The reality that people cut off from the digital world don't care much about the commitment to speeds. They just want to know when they'll be reliably connected. Right now, too many of our vulnerable and isolated people have little or no confidence or trust in their broadband network. Unreliable internet connection alone is a barrier to them even considering accessing the internet and its benefits. I genuinely hope that this government's R100 can be delivered by 2021. However, as other members have said, and Digital Scotland suggests, that the Scottish government faces significant challenges in delivering R100 within the time frame. That said, the Scottish Conservatives welcome the, the motion today and we welcome the report referred to by the Minister in our motion for Carnegie UK. If we get it right for Scotland, everyone, no matter where or who, should benefit from solutions in blue light and justice sector that will deliver better government, uh, better governance, automation and therefore speedier process. It will benefit from improved choice and availability in education moving from reliance on physical posts to digital channels, and health by better support for clinicians and technology that encourages patient engagement, and improvements derived from individual focused communications and transactions between councils and their citizens. And interactive solutions for, so, for social housing and care at home, bringing more choice and independence for, and far more face-to-face -face time allocated to those who need it most. The biggest benefit from digital inclusion will of course be felt by those groups who are currently excluded from participating in much of what the majority take for granted. Therefore, getting everybody on board is critical and getting those who need it more on board should be on board first and that should be our overriding ambition. Members have mentioned the Carnegie report 
where Clever Clogs is highlighted as a digital and social care system delivering to help those who have never used the internet or don't, or don't have technology skills, confidence or the ability to, to independently uh, use it at home, bringing huge positives for many of its participants. An SCVO report states that having systems like Clever Clogs in place is absolutely vital for pushing for an inclusive digital society. The report also highlighted that over one in five in Scotland do not have basic digital skills. Equally worrying is almost half of businesses in Scotland identify gaps in their digital skills, with 21% of businesses believing that these gaps in skills are significant. We seriously need to push for more children to get involved in digital courses, a point not lost on the leading businesses last night taking part in the RBS tech pitch, uh, which was attended by the minister. A connected Scotland, the government draft strategy to tackle social isolation and loneliness included responses reinforcing the importance of inclusion, such as digital technology can facilitate social connection, particularly where it links people to in-person activities or services. Digital inclusion was also viewed as beneficial for rural communities and disabled people as a way of overcoming geographical and physical barriers to social interaction. Including everyone in the digital revolution is one of the biggest challenges we face as society. If we don't get it right, we run an increased risk of creating a further, further digital divide. A digital divide that this time not only simply refers to connectivity, but a digital divide between those who can and those who cannot benefit from the fast approach in digital society. A problem very apparent in rural areas, as my colleague Don, Donald Cameron's amendment refers. Equally important, we can't forget how important it is that everyone have the required skills, not only to utilize digital solutions, but also to develop them. Education and training must start now and include everyone, from almost the cradle to almost the grave. Digital inclusion will be the defining challenge of our age. Let's get it right. Thank you very much. And I call on Janie Hebburn to close for the government till five o'clock. Minister, please. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I uh, begin uh, by uh, thanking those who have taken part in uh, today's uh, debate? And let me uh, settle something very clearly at the outset of the debate to resolve uh, the uh, debate between Mr Carson and my colleague Ms Forbes. Neither of them represent the most beautiful constituents in Scotland. That privilege is entirely uh, mine. Um, can I... Uh, welcome the contributions that we've had uh, across uh, the chamber. I think there has been, by and large, uh, a great degree of consensus in those contributions. And I think that comes from uh, an acceptance across the board from every member of the point that Colin Smith correctly uh, laid out, and I think Rhoda Grant uh, re-emphasised that uh, digital access, access to digital services is now viewed uh, as an essential, it's viewed as an essential component of life, just the same way as access to utilities are. And I recognise that. I recognise that it is a social and economic imperative that we ensure that people have access to uh, the <coughs> technology, to the infrastructure, and also the skills that they can uh, use to harness uh, that technology. So in that uh, regard, I think it is uh, important that we recognise uh, the work that has taken place, uh, led by this uh, government, but involving uh, the wider public sector, uh, the private sector, the voluntary sector, uh, and it's taken uh, a place right across the length and breadth of Scotland to, to, to increase digital inclusion across uh, the country. And in that regard, uh, we do see uh, some uh, significant progress. The latest figures uh, that were, are available show that digital uh, participation in Scotland has risen from just under 63% in 2007 to 82% in uh, 2016. And over that same uh, period of time, the gap in internet access between the lowest and highest income brackets uh, decreased from 67% to 30%. So in that regard, uh, let me say to Mr. Smith, um, whilst recognising that we have had great consensus, I thought uh, his amendment where uh, it spoke of the Scottish Government failing uh, to tackle digital exclusion was a little uncharitable. And in that regard, uh, I cannot accept his uh, amendment. What I can uh, say, of course, though, is that I recognise uh, that there is still a challenge before us. Uh, we have seen 
uh, that gap narrow, as I have laid out in terms of digital participation, access to uh, digital infra infrastructure, uh, internet uh, access. What we've seen over the last few years is uh, a flat line amongst those in the uh, highest uh, income deciles, largely because we've reached saturation point in terms of uh, access to uh, the internet and to uh, uh, digital technology. Uh, the challenge now is for us to ensure that we uh, uh, bridge the gap between uh, those uh, who have that access and those who don't. Uh, Jamie Green uh, spoke about uh, the uh, concern uh, that one in five uh, people in Scotland lack uh, digital uh, skills. He said it was the SCVO that have identified that uh, as a concern. That is, uh, of course, a concern. That's why the Scottish Government has laid out its digital participation strategy. And one of the key players in responding to that challenge is uh, the SCVO itself. We're working with the SCVO, we're working with registered social landlords, we're working with third sector organisations to respond to that challenge, working closely with them because, of course, uh, we recognise that they are in most direct contact uh, with uh, people who we need to involve in uh, the process. Uh, the area of the population, of course, where we see uh, the uh, digital deficit, deficit uh, most uh, pronounced, of course, as has, has been said, uh, in uh, older people. And that's why, of course, the Scottish Government has taken forward its Let's Get uh, Online uh, programme, encouraging uh, older people to take first steps to getting uh, online, uh, supported by a, a wide range uh, of uh, activity to promote that campaign. So in that regard, um, we have made a lot of progress. There is uh, more to be done and more will be done. And as part of that, of course, Mike Rumbles uh, spoke of the need for a meaningful process of education. A and I, of course, uh, agree with that. That's why, through our uh, STEM strategy, we're encouraging people to pursue uh, careers in digital uh, through uh, the variety of careers, advice and information uh, and guidance they can get in school. That's why we are putting in place a foundation apprenticeship in the school environment uh, in software and hardware. Uh, that's why we're increasing the number of college and university student placements with employers in STEM curriculum areas. That's why uh, we have now got a graduate apprenticeship in software uh, and hardware, ensuring that our education system is geared towards uh, equipping people with uh, the uh, digital skills that they need. Of course. Uh, I must call you. Mike Sorry. Rumbles, please. Thank you. Because my main point was actually, in, in addition to education, was that I think where there's a will, there's a way that if this, and I'm trying to be helpful to the Scottish Government here, if it could bring forward the 100% target to May, uh, I think the Scottish ben Government would benefit tremendously uh, by, by doing that. So the people of Scotland would benefit greatly. And of course, the, the rewards would be reaped by the Scottish Government if it would do that uh, in accordance with its own manifesto on page nine. Minister. Well, well, I look forward to Mike Rumble's newfound charitable attitude towards the Scottish Government being the hallmark and feature of every contribution he makes in this chamber. And let me assure him, I will uh, take on the issue of infrastructure uh, in a minute, uh, because I do recognise that's uh, important. But I wanted to pick up on a few other uh, contributions uh, from other members. Uh, importantly, Emma Harper, because she invited Kate Forbes to visit her region. I am happy to accept that invite on Kate Forbes' uh, behalf. I, I can tell the Chamber she did uh, uh, actually say that it would be okay to, to do that. Uh, but she also spoke of the, the need to utilise digital uh, technology for a better uh, health management uh, as well. And again, that's one of the other ways we can demonstrate the need to uh, increase the uh, digital competence of Scotland's population by investing in that uh, area because there can be uh, great health benefits through that approach. That's why uh, we now uh, welcome the fact that there are uh, over 2 million visitors in a single month to the NHS Inform uh, website. That's why uh, we now have the Attend Anywhere video consultation service operating in the NHS uh, Highland area. That's why we have uh, home and mobile health monitoring used to uh, uh, inform self-management uh, decisions uh, by the patient, support diagnosis, uh, treatment and care decisions by professionals uh, supporting them. Uh, and that's why, of course, it was very welcome in uh, the uh, findings of uh, the report that we're debating today uh, in terms of social care that, although not part of the, the main study, uh, we see Clever Clogs as the potential as a telecare uh, device uh, as well. In, and in uh, Edinburgh, the Edinburgh City Council uh, region, that's uh, supported 
uh, some uh, 15 people who wanted to change their method of overnight care, uh, which has improved the service for them, but also led to savings for the local authority. Bill Kidd also spoke very tellingly of the power of technology, supporting those uh, with dyslexia, which again was another uh, reminder of uh, the positive power of technological change. There was, and this is where I turn uh, to... Uh, yes. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. I, I may have been the only member who talked about digital rights as prominently, but does the government accept the basic point that I was making, that as we live more of our lives online, we're only going to maximise the benefits uh, and reduce and manage any potential downsides if digital rights are every much part of the, the government's focus as digital participation? And, and what is the government going to be doing to address that agenda? Well, Minister. The short answer is yes, I do accept that. Um, there is work underway, but uh, time is short, so I'd be happy to respond to uh, Mr Harvey if he wanted to, to write to me uh, in that regard on a, on a fuller basis. I do want to turn to the issue of infra infrastructure because there was some discussion about that. Uh, understandably, uh, Mike Rumbles invited me to, to comment at Donald Cameron. Uh, did, and I want to place uh, this in context because I think it's important to do so. Digi the digital uh, Scotland a super fast broadband a scheme exceeded its 95 per cent fibre coverage target by the end of last year. It's benefited some 900,000 homes in the country. And the reason and the point of saying that is to place very clearly uh, the context of, and let's take the Highlands and Islands area as a specific example, because I know that's one that Mr Cameron will be interested in. Without that level of investment, coverage in the Highlands and Islands would have just been 21 per cent. There was no planned commercial coverage at all in Orkney, Shetland or the Western Isles. So it's only through the activity that we have engaged in that we now see the coverage we have. But yes, of course, we need to go uh, further. And that's why uh, the R100 uh, programme remains a concerted area of focus for us. There was uh, some concern expressed that we will not hit that target. Let me uh, be very clear. The manner in which we are delivering the contracts we have put in place the prioritisation of the areas that we know must be targeted first because they won't be hit commercially. Rural uh, Scotland uh, will uh, be the focus of our activity. Uh, so we will hit that target. We're very confident of hitting that target. But if Mr Cameron or any of his colleagues have those concerns, they are, of course, welcome to raise them with us. But equally, I hope they will be speaking to their colleagues in the United Kingdom government to express their concerns that they are contributing only 3.5% of the £600 million of investment that we are leveraging into that infrastructure. That is a sign of this government's commitment to this agenda, as is the range of activity that we have in place and that is underway to ensure that everyone in Scotland can benefit. Jeremy Balfour, let me close with Jeremy Balfour's point because it was one I agreed with. If we don't have a digitally inclusive society, we will have failed. I agree with that. And let me make clear, President Officer, this government does not intend to fail. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on a digital society for all working together to maximise the benefits of digital inclusion. And we turn straight to decision time. The first question is that amendment 14509.3 in the name of Donald Cameron, which seeks to amend motion 14509 in the name of Kate Forbes on a digital society for all, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 14509.2 in the name of Colin Smith, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Kate Forbes, be agreed. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 14509.2 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 47, no, 68. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the final question is that motion 14509 in the name of Kate Forbes as amended on a digital, digital society for all be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We'll move on shortly to members' business in the name of Colin Smith on ban on the export of live animals for slaughter and fattening. But we'll just take a few moments for the minister and ministers to change seats and for members to take seats.